Hello everyone, my name is Pixelriffs and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day. In today's episode, we're actually going to start working on the floating island that we started drafting in the last episode. We're going to be working on a recreation of a an illustration that I found during the holiday break called Pirate Rock Sailing by Greg Fromento. And the main thing I want to do today is work out the shape and the style of the floating island that we're going to be building in this valley. And using a couple of techniques that you can take into your own worlds to try and build your own floating islands. Because there are approaches to building terrain that will make life a heck of a lot easier for you if you try them out. So we're going to grab a bunch of stone to begin with. I'm probably going to bring a shulker box of stone over here because we will be using it all eventually. But we're going to start with a very simple shape building exercise and that is to build a wireframe. Frame. There are a couple of really good reasons to start any kind of large terrain project like this with a wireframe. The first of which is that you don't have to commit as many materials to building something which is effectively a series of lines that you're building in the sky instead of a solid piece of terrain. And the funny thing is I actually want to start building this sort of centrally in this valley but that's exactly where this ridge of dirt exists and where I started the stone mine where we put our first beacon. So I'm actually going to take down this pillar of diorite that was marking the entrance to that. It'll be pretty obvious where the entrance is because there's a giant two by one hole in the ground. We're also going to tear away some of the dirt from around here so that we start in this kind of basin in the center of the valley. And we can look at doing a bit of subtractive terraforming as well as the additive terraforming we're going to be doing by adding an island here. But there are a couple of other really great reasons to start building this as a wireframe. One of which is that you can move it around a little more easily if you have fewer blocks to put up and take down. I'm mostly planning on looking at this build from the top of the mountain over there. And realistically, if we continue to work around my starter base area, we're only going to be seeing this build from this angle the majority of the time. Now, of course, I want to build this floating island in a more realistic set of proportions so that when we fly around it, you can still get the same impression from any angle. But I expect the majority of the time I'm going to be looking at it from over there. And so I want to be able to look down at the floating island and see some of the grass on the top and the ship and everything without it being like I'm looking up at a rock wall and it's obscuring the bits of the build that I find the most interesting, like the ship that we're building on top of it. So even though this island is going to be floating off the ground, I'm actually going to start it relatively low down in this valley, as though it's just lifting it off or as though it's coming in to land in this area. We could even, if we wanted to, turn this earthworks that we're now creating into a crater underneath as though it's separated from the land right here and is about to sail off on its first adventure. But if we do end up doing that, I'm going to treat that as a separate project. It's not really like in the scope of what I want to do with this floating island build because it's just going to add extra hours to the amount of building that I will need to do. And that's a whole separate video in itself that we might end up tackling further into the series. But here we go. I've carved out enough room to work here. We've brought this more or less in line with the floor of the valley on either side and right here we are at Y88 which is still about 24 blocks higher than sea level. But considering that the structure of the floating island is going to be relatively tall so that we can see it from the top of this mountain over here we're at Y135 I think that's a pretty decent starting point. I can also look down on the valley here and see that that's a relatively central spot. We could maybe move it over a couple of blocks to the right, but I actually like the idea of this floating island being directly over an area where I've been mining for stone. Kind of makes sense. We're displacing all of that stone and bringing it up to the surface so it can be turned into something beautiful. So now with our shulker box of stone, we're going to grab a couple of stacks of this, probably put some dirt away in here as we go, and I'm going to try my best to follow what I think is the line of the underside of the island as seen in Greg Fromanto's illustration. So we're actually going to be building this as though we can follow the shape in our Minecraft world. And I have done a bit of experimentation with this in a creative mode test world, just to try and get an idea of how much of this is possible. This is the third reason to start with a wireframe for this project, actually, because the inspiration image is a 2D image. And so we can start by drawing a flat section of the outline of this island, the silhouette that we want the island to have from a distance, and we can work on building it up in 3D space from there. But starting with a piece of terrain already built is going to be a lot easier than starting with a blank canvas. Naturally, we're going to have to start this a few blocks off the ground. So I'm going to pillar up with a few blocks of stone here, but then remove the ones from below so we can make sure that they aren't counted in our calculations when we're trying to figure out the shape of this thing. This will also get it out of the way of the terrain to either side, and honestly, it might be a good idea to 
bring some scaffolding along with this just in case we fall off. But I'm going to try and wing it a little bit here. And we're going to aim west first. But the island is going to taper down to a single point below the entire structure. And then we're going to start moving in this direction at kind of a 45 degree angle. And I will say that if you don't feel like counting all of this, then one good idea would be to bring in a camera account if you have a second account that you can load into the world. Alternatively, you can look into mods which have a free cam mode where you can separate the point of view from your character and take a look at things from a third person perspective. You can sort of do that with the third person camera in game, but it gets a little bit tricky to look at these shapes from the outside. And the alternative is flying away, looking at it from a distance in game and then coming back up to the top here, which is going to waste a lot of rockets traveling back and forth. The other tricky thing here is going to be making sure that this island has a dynamic shape. And in Greg's illustration, the island actually dips back down in a couple of places underneath the where the rock formation is hanging from below. And that's going to be difficult to build on the fly like this, but I've worked out the shape and created beforehand. So hopefully this will be a little easier. And once we've reached the highest point of this upward curve, this is I think where we're going to start the grassland area that the ship is going to be built on. I'm going to take the Y coordinate down of this. So we're at Y125, just going to screenshot that to make sure that we have it. And flying down to take a look at this from a distance, you'll see that we have a pretty dynamic shape for one half of our floating island. So now we're going to hop back onto the central column. We're going to build up the other side of the floating island, and we're going to aim to stop around the same Y coordinate, 125. That way, we can make sure that there's a flat piece of land we can build at that coordinate, and that will be the point from which we build all of the stuff on top of the island. We can also take a moment to look back at this from a distance, look down the valley and see the shape of this thing, and decide whether or not that is the right sort of height for it. We are standing at Y124 here, so we've certainly stopped at the correct height in terms of being able to see the flat grassland on top and the ship behind it. And looking at it now, it sort of feels like the island is hanging too low, but I think that's really because of this dirt mound we have to either side. So once we remove that, I think the island is going to be sitting a little bit deeper in the valley than you might expect, but I don't think it's going to look entirely unnatural. On the other hand, raising it up by a couple of blocks isn't going to hurt too much either, and now is probably the time to decide on that positioning, because there are so few blocks committed to the build so far, we've only placed about a stack and a half of stone. I think we can afford to raise it by a couple of blocks. So I'm going to take down this stuff, but then rebuild it a couple of blocks higher. Now that I know what the shape is going to be, it should be fairly simple to do that. And a short time later, it was a rainy day, so I skipped recording that one, but we've moved the entire thing up by five blocks. So the top of those pillars there is now Y130. And I built out the other side according to the more or less proportions that I see in Greg's illustration, including some of the sections over on this side, which hang down directly from the surface of the underside of the rock here, kind of like stalactites. And I think that's a really important detail because it changes the silhouette. It doesn't just mirror the same thing on the opposite side. It gives each side its own distinctive character, which I think works really well and is going to help our floating island feel a bit more realistic. And so far, when we take a look at it from a distance or when I kind of hop over the side of the hill returning from my base to go sleep or pick up some more supplies, it really does feel like something is already here, which is a feeling that you want. I find one of the most difficult parts of starting the process of building like this is not being able to visualize it without having something in the world already. So now we've got this here, it's fairly obvious where the shapes of this floating island are going to go, where its curves are, where the overhangs and cavities are going to be. And now that I'm pretty committed to the shape, the next thing I'm going to do, although this might seem like a strange move to some of you, is to completely fill in this shape with stone. Obviously, we're not going to do much in the 3D space yet, we're just going to fill in this 2D shape from this point to this point with a full wall of stone. And once again, having a flat shape like this in the world is going to help us to visualize what we want to do with the project next. Obviously, at this point, we only want to commit to this when we're happy with the position of the build, because otherwise you're putting a lot of stone in that you're just going to have to take out again. The other thing to note as we fill in this last row is that this whole wireframe section of the build that we have built is now over 60 blocks wide, which is really important because remember the ship that we drafted in the previous episode was at least 50 blocks wide. So knowing that there is more than enough room to support the ship 
on the structure of this floating island is a very important step in making sure that we've committed to the right scale of build. And it seems like one side of this is actually slightly taller than the other. On this side, the western side, we're actually one block higher than the eastern side. So this is at 130 on the y-axis and this is at y129. But I actually think that works out quite well. To have the island at a slight tilt feels a bit more realistic in a sense. But to give you an idea of the materials we've consumed so far, we are now down to less than one third of the stone remaining in this shulker box. So we've gone from only using a couple of stacks to using basically 18 or 20 stacks of stone now. And as we fly away, you can start to see the outline of the island and it's starting to feel a lot more substantial, right? And if our version of Pirate Rock Sailing was going to be a pixel art representation of it here in game, then that would not be too bad. But of course, we are looking at building this as a 3D model. And so it's going to be a little bit more complicated than that. But already starting with this shape has given me a lot more confidence in this build. And it makes a lot more sense to move on to the next step now that I'm fairly certain this this is looking how I want it. Of course, putting all of this material in here seems like a bit of a mistake when that's not going to be visible from the outside. But there are two things about that. The first of which is that this is stone. You're going to be able to get it in large quantities basically anywhere in the world. So committing this much stone to a project is not going to be a huge deal in the grand scheme of things. The other thing is that, of course, we can always set up a beacon and take away some of this stone later if we want to just insta mine a bunch of that out from the center of the island. But as a structural element right now, this gives me a much better idea of what I want the shape to look like. So I think it's actually an important step, even though we're doing this kind of piecemeal in survival. With the island in two dimensions here though, the next step is to move it into three dimensions. We're going to start another section of wireframe coming out here, and we're going to go north and south with it. The main issue with that being, of course, that we can no longer really work from the illustration because it's in two dimensions and we're trying to make it 3D. Now, obviously, Greg has drawn the original piece with a certain amount of depth in the foreground, so we can kind of get a sense of the curvature of the island if we you know, fudge it a little bit and interpret it as best we can. But of course, the back half of the island we are never going to see. So that's something that we can try and use the skills that we've already developed here, try and work with the shapes to either side and try our best to approximate what we think is going to be a good outer curve for the back of the island. I actually want the island to be slightly wider than it is deep, so as long as it can manage to be about 50 or 60 blocks wide, considering that the central part of the island here is going to be about 64 blocks wide, I think that'll be a decent target to aim for. But considering that the lowest block of the island here is at Y95 and the tallest block up there is at Y130, the island is only going to be 35 blocks tall. So we actually want to come out from the island a little bit more than we go up. We actually want to be moving horizontally more than we move vertically in a kind of one and a half to one ratio. So as we build this back section, I am going to build in a couple of little overhangs and stuff like that, just to make sure that we don't travel too far upwards, even though the majority of the time we want to be staircasing a little bit. The only other point I will add is that the edges of the island tend to get a little steeper before it curves down into these underhangs and stuff. It's sort of like there's a cliff edge around the outside of the island as we circumnavigate it. And so I think it's best to apply the same approach to the front and back sections, the north and south sections of the island here as well. Just taking a look at the back half here, I'd say, yeah, that looks pretty decent to me. I've kind of copied a few of the shapes that we've used elsewhere in the build, so that looks nice. And the ship is going to be sitting just just behind the center line of the island about here. So I think we'll try and make the front half of the island slightly longer since it doesn't look like we've gone too far out here. We've gone up but maybe not as far out as we could do. And now it's time for the south face. And we've got to bear in mind that there are some overhangs around here that have to connect to something a little bit, but we can work that out a little bit closer once we get the 3D shape going. Okay, that's the south side built. Let's turn around and take a look at it from the center line here so that we can see both sides of that. And yeah, I think I'm happy with that overall. They look fairly similar. I've kind of copied the west facing side a little bit more than the east, but overall, this looks like a shape that we can start to blend together. And now we're going to do exactly the same thing, where we fill in this entire shape with stone so that we create something that looks like a cross section, sort of like the grass model or the sugarcane model that you see Minecraft using a lot. I'm also going to refill my stone shulker box just so that we have enough. And we'll start filling in the north and south facing areas of our wireframe. And with each of these four sections filled in, we can start to fly around the structure here. And you'll see that even though this obviously looks like a giant 
plus shape <laughs> hanging in the air with all of these stone blocks attached to it. From any of the diagonal faces now, we can start to see the shape of a 3D structure. And it's a lot easier to visualize this way than it is with just the wireframe, because it feels like there are solid sections that have a very obvious shape to them. And the next stage, of course, is to figure out how exactly these four faces connect to each other in 3D space. And there are a few things here that I want to note before we continue. The first is that building stuff in the sky in survival is really kind of a pain because you're gonna be falling off of this thing a lot unless you are very, very careful. And one of the things I recommend doing is getting familiar with scaffolding. You're gonna be using scaffolding a lot when you're building floating islands like this. And the difficulty with scaffolding is that it's slightly different how it controls in Java and Bedrock editions. So if I give you a tutorial for it, which I eventually will at some point in this series, on Java edition, the controls are going to be different than they are on Bedrock edition. The other thing about scaffolding is it's great for vertical transport, but not so much for horizontal, because once you place six blocks of scaffolding out in a row like this, the seventh block is going to fall, at which point you have to start another tower of scaffolding. So if you're bringing scaffolding, bring a lot of it. The other thing I will say, and this might be personal preference, but it might be experience talking at the same time, is to start at the top. Ridiculous though it sounds, it's a lot easier to build a realistic looking island from the top down than it is from the bottom up, and I'll explain why. These four planes that we've established, these four sections that travel east, west, north, and south from that central point, you'd think are probably going to be the most pointy sections of the island. They're going to be the furthest out that the island goes in any of those directions. So you might be tempted to just start the next section of the island in one block from that so that it comes to a point, right? you actually want to avoid doing that, surprisingly. Because at this height, the island is going to be wide enough that it's actually going to have several sections of rock which are, you know, five or six blocks wide, possibly even more than that. There are going to be these solid rock faces here that extend several blocks in each direction before the island starts to shrink inwards. Naturally, the volume of the island is going to shrink the further down you get, the closer you get towards that central point at the lowest point of the island, but up here, it's going to feel broader and wider and if you start with that most shrunken point at the bottom of the island there, it's actually difficult to shake off the shrinking nature of the terrain there, and it's going to feel like you end up with something that feels more like a diamond shape, which you could of course build on top of if you wanted to, but I think it's easier to come up here and start working on these larger faces of the island first. But this is once again a point where if it's possible for you to do so, I recommend bringing in a second point of view. Either bring in a camera account or enable some sort of free cam mod that allows you to fly around detached from your player character because it's going to be a lot easier to shape these sections if you look at them from the outside. And it can be really difficult to keep that perspective if you're working on a project like this up close. One other thing to keep in mind is that symmetry can also feel a little artificial. So where possible, if you can create small deviations in the way the rock formations work, you're going to find that looks a lot more natural and organic feeling than it does if you were to keep everything perfectly symmetrical across this axis. And wherever possible, try to build overlapping areas of material like this. Work in larger sections instead of just doing a pillar at a time and sticking to a one block area in a vertical column. I think it makes a lot more sense to build stuff like overlapping scales, like a, a dragon or a fish or something would have. And remember that even though this is time consuming, anything you do right now can be adjusted later. So give yourself permission to just go with it. Like writing a book, it's going to be a lot easier to edit once you have a completed first draft. Once you've started fleshing out the higher points of the island, around here once you've started getting those flat surfaces in, you could just start building rock formations and curve them around and do a bit of trial and error until they match up as you go. But I think one of the better ways of doing this, continuing this wireframe approach, is to build out a series of, in this case, quarter circles that are going to connect this section of the island to that section of the island. And that allows you to kind of bridge out towards the island, sort of see where you're going a little bit more and you create those maybe four or five blocks apart, occasionally putting in random sections where there is a longer stretch or a stretch that's a little bit more angular. And then when you start the quarter circle a few blocks down, you can mirror that slightly and change the shape a little bit as you go and then figure out in vertical space how those two connect up. It can be easy to get discouraged when looking at terrain like this because it doesn't really look like a whole lot right now. It's just a bunch of stone. We haven't added in any of the texture blocks yet and it has a tendency just to look a little bit noisy thanks to all of the light faces and shadows that are 
are in here. But don't worry about that now. Press forward because we can start to make this place look a lot more coherent once the entire thing comes together. Let's get a few more of these quarter circles in and let's see how we can connect those up. So with a few more of these contour lines in place, you can see how some of them are a little bit irregular and some of them mirror the ones above a little bit more accurately. That allows us to add some shape to this, dictated a little bit randomly as we go, but we can create some interesting rock formations as we go down here. And now it's simply a matter of connecting all of these up. It will even leave a couple of areas of overhang where we can fit in some more of these spikes, the stalactites dripping down from underneath the island, and that's going to give a little bit more character to that side emphasizing the detail that we found in Greg's illustration. And so now we can either work from the top down or from the bottom up and connect up these areas from the inside or the outside, depending on whether you prefer scaffolding or if you just like to get in here and try and build some stuff. Remember though, it's going to be seen from the outside much more frequently than from the inside. So the outside impression, the overall picture is really what you want to be focused on. And it's only taken about half an hour for the rest of this stone to go in, but I think this is a fairly dynamic looking chunk of a float island. We've got a few strong stone faces in there. Obviously, it's looking a little bit jumbled, and you might be wondering where on earth are all of those texture blocks that I identified in the previous episode as part of our build palette. Those are going to go in later, because there are a few other things we want to do. First of all, we want to get the entire structure of this thing built out, and then we want to maybe simplify a couple of these more jagged sections. We're going to identify where some of the overhangs and stuff are so that we can put some of the darker stone in there to use it for shading. And while, strictly speaking, we don't need to light up the darker areas like this, I think it'll probably be a good idea to throw in something like glow lichen just so the whole thing can feel a bit more evenly lit and we don't end up with so many darker shadows like this. Speaking of shadows though, we do need to make sure we've got a few torches down on the ground because from this point onwards, the island up here is going to be obstructing sunlight to the ground below. So as we go, I'm going to fill in any dark spaces that I see. There's definitely a few forming around here already. We're just going to drop a torch down and carry on as normal. And since the wandering trader is here, I might as well talk to him. Oh, and he's trading red sand. Okay, this is one of those trades that I might actually get some use out of. Not for this project, obviously, but since there's a finite amount of red sand in the game, yeah, I think I'll buy some of that. We can only buy 24 blocks at a time. Maybe I'll spend the rest on vines and make myself some mossy cobble. Stone. <laughs> anyway, from a distance, I think this island is starting to look pretty cool. It's certainly coming together, and once we've got the grass on top with a slope leading up to the ship, I think this is really going to look pretty spectacular. In the meantime, though, we've got a lot more work to do on the outside of this. We have three more quarters of the circle, three more quadrants to fill in, so I think I'm going to get that done on a live stream so that you can see the process happening in real time. We're also going to make sure we do an adequate amount of lighting on the interior here because, of course, this is going to remain hollow. It's going to be far too much stone to fill this entire thing in. And once that layer of grass and other materials goes on top of this, we don't want it to turn into a mob farm. But for now, it's time to get the rest of this island built, so I'm going to go ahead and do that, and I'll see you folks on the other side. Hey folks, welcome back. So on the other side of our hillside here, we have a pretty substantial floating island now. And from above, because we've been working with these in sort of half circle formations, it does look a little bit round, but I think that sort of works out okay. There is a section over here where the island is a little bit more distended. It kind of pulls out in this direction, which I quite like. And at ground level, there are a couple of things that I want to note. First of all, the section on the underside there is very much in shadow. And I haven't done anything with the lighting. We are still on full brightness. I have one torch up in there because there is a section that the terrain sort of inverts and it becomes a little bit more possible for mobs to spawn in there because there's a ledge that they can stand on. So I've decided to light that up, but the rest of this I have left in shadow. It's a very dramatic shadow though, even at full brightness. So I might have to do something about that a little bit later, either by putting some glow lichen up there or spamming some torches here and there. But I do want this whole thing to feel relatively natural. On that topic though, there are some faces of this which when seen from certain angles do feel a little bit too cluttered. They feel too jumbly, especially areas like this where there's effectively a staircase of rock in this area. And I want to try and make some of the facets of the island feel a little bit more regular. So I'm going to take a smoothing pass of sorts at this. I'm basically going to go over the entire thing and try and make some of the more jumbled bits feel a little bit more geometric, which might seem counterintuitive to the whole idea of making this 
this feel more natural. But honestly, when you look at a rock, when you look at a stone in the real world, it has smooth patches and faces that are formed naturally by the lifespan of that rock and what it's been through. The, the environment has shaped it in certain ways. And you can imagine this island being eroded by the wind, even if it's been pulled out of the ground wholesale in this massive chunk it has still had to be shaped in some form and, you know, extra bits might have fallen off of it. So there are some areas that we could potentially smooth out a little bit if they look like there's just too much going on and they're not very pleasant to look at. We're going to continue dangling these stalactite formations from underneath the right hand side and I do have a bit of an overhang on the left hand side that we might do some similar stuff with, but I don't think it's going to look very good if those are all dangling down that way if everything else around them kind of looks a bit messy. But that's going to be a longer and more boring job and it's probably going to involve a lot of scaffolding, especially since it's easier seen from the outside. So for the moment, I'm going to leave that and I'm just going to paper over the top of this with a layer of grass. Looking at the dish of this entire thing, you'll notice that I've spaced torches out pretty evenly. I've had the F3 debug view up while I did that just to make sure that I was placing stuff where block light was going to be adequate and that there weren't any more dark spaces. I was also doing part of this at night, so I'm fairly confident this place is pretty much spawn proof on the inside, which is good because we're going to cover over the entire thing with grass blocks, just in one layer for now. But this is effectively going to provide the first of many terrain layers, which we're going to build up and shape as the project goes on. We're not going to get this finished today. This is going to be a multi-episode project. It already is, really. But we're just going to fill this up with grass right the way to the edges of the island, and for now, no further. Although it's going to make a lot more sense to have some grass and moss spilling over the edges of the island to make it feel a bit more natural. This is also going to take a lot of grass blocks, so thankfully I have a decent amount enough to fill a shulker box, but I might need to go and get some dirt if that's not enough to cover the entire surface area of this. I haven't exactly mathed out how much we're going to need here. And if this was a circle, we know the diameter is 64 blocks, so according to my calculations, if I'm remembering how to do the area of a circle correctly, that's going to be about 3,000 blocks. Yeah, that felt like about 3,000 grass grass blocks to me. <laughs> it was most of the grass that I currently had. I did have to use a little bit of dirt at the back here just in case we couldn't fill the rest with grass, but we managed to get this taken care of and it obviously looks like a flat section of grass right now. There's not a huge amount of detail around the outside, but even with the grass on top, something does feel a bit more complete about it. Now obviously from down here we're not going to be able to see the top face of the island like I wanted to, but from up here the hints of grass start to make themselves known and of course above that is where we're going to be building the ship that's going to be the centerpiece of this entire thing. So hopefully you folks have enjoyed this little look at building out floating islands or at least making a start on them. The majority of the work has really been done and it's all about pushing through until you have a finished product or at least something that you can mold into a finished product and add the fine detail to a little bit later on, or perhaps even take out some of the fine detail in the case of this one. We will see, but folks, that's where we're going to leave it for this episode of the Minecraft Survival Guide. Hopefully you've learned a little bit about terraforming and how to construct a bit of custom floating terrain at least. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixorifs. Don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it, subscribe if you want to see more, and I'll see you folks soon. Take care, bye for now.